Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Carrie Mongol. She's Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Stony Brook University and the Trukana Basin Institute, and she also heads the Mongol Lab. Uh, her research aims to reconstruct the major trends and transitions that characterize hominin diversity and evolution. And today we're going to talk about some of the work Dr. Mungal does with those goals in mind. So Dr. Mungal, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Thanks for having me. So I would like by by start uh, to ask, uh, I would like to start by asking you about the work you do or have done in the Trukana Basin Basin in Kenya. So uh, first of all, tell us perhaps about the Turkana Basin. Uh, what's that site about, and also about the hominin fossils that you've studied there? Yeah, of course. Um, so the Turkana Basin, just to kind of locate everyone on a map, is in northern Kenya, kind of right on the border with Ethiopia. Um, and it's referring to an area on both the east and the west side of Lake Turkana. Mm -hmm. um, so this has been, it's kind of centrally located in the Rift Valley. And one of our most prolific fossil sites um, dating back to uh, Richard Leakey starting work there in kind of the, the 1960s, uh, following his family's work uh, in Olduvai in Tanzania. Uh, so work has continued there. And, and as you said in my introduction, I'm part of the Turkana Basin Institute, which Richard Leakey had established as a way to bring in more researchers and, and infrastructure to work in that area. Yeah. Um, and we have just a huge collection of fossils that tell us about human evolution. Um, coming from this area, and especially uh, at a time around, we'll say like 2 million years ago, when we have multiple species living on the landscape, some that might be directly ancestral to us, um, some that are probably our evolutionary cousins. Um, and so I'm really fortunate to have been invited to kind of come in and, and work on some of these fossils. Um, some of our more recent ones that we've been working on from there um, have been uh, we had a, a dentition, uh, so all of the lower teeth that belong to probably something like Homo habilis. Um, mm -hmm. That was discovered by Neve and Louise Leakey and their team. Um, what's exciting about that dentition isn't necessarily that we found more teeth, although, you know, anthropologists love our teeth. Uh, <laughs> it's that, uh, <laughs> that they're probably associated with a skeleton as well that we're in the process of describing. And, and that's what's What's really exciting is is so many of these hominin species. We we have an idea what their what their face looked like or what their teeth looked like, but we don't know what their um, arms and legs would have looked like. And so that's one of the big things we're working on right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we're going to get uh, into more of the specifics surrounding uh, cranial, dental, and postcranial. Uh, features of different hominin species. I mean, basically the phylogenetic work you do based on that. But uh, uh, just before that, why is it that uh, you study teeth uh, so much? I, I mean, is it just because they just so happen to fossilize easily or it's easy to find them as fossil remains or is there any other reason for that? Convenience is a big part of it. So they do fossilize much more readily than the rest of the skeleton. Um, so yeah. we're much more likely to find them. Um, and usually when we're looking at hominins, especially if we're looking in that time period where we have um, the genus Homo and the genus Paranthropus, the teeth are really distinctive. So one, we have a lot of them. And two, when we have them, we kind of know what species they belong to. And that can be mm -hmm. really helpful when we're trying to make assessments about what hominin was where. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, tell us perhaps then about some of the features, cranial, dental and postcranial features that you study in the fossil remnants of the hominins you're interested in. Um, so you mentioned my work is in phylogenetics and, and basically what that means is I'm trying to reconstruct how all of these things are related to one another. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at the fossil anatomy, 
<clears throat> I'm looking for characteristics that indicate some kind of shared evolutionary history. So, you know, I'm looking for something that is evident in the anatomy because these various fossils shared a common ancestor, not because, um, you know, you see a trait where someone maybe broke their arm and, and you've got a, a bump on the humerus because of that. Yeah. Um, so an example might be, um, you know, we know that, or we think that bipedalism is a shared trait among all hominins. Um, so everything since our split with our common ancestor with chimpanzees. So if we're looking at fossils and we want to define it as a hominin, we might look for something that indicates that they had, say, um, a really anterior foramen magnum. So that big hole in the bottom of the skull is exiting directly up and down instead of kind of more towards the back. So that would be a trait that I would use um, mm -hmm. in some of these analyses. Uh, but, uh, I mean, of course, we would have to get into the specifics here. But basically, what kinds of information can you acquire by studying this sort of features, particularly when it comes to phylogenetics? Mm -hmm. So what we want is an accumulation of features that kind of points towards uh, a shared ancestor. So an example might be we have several species that we call Paranthropus. And in all of these species, we see kind of a suite of craniodental characteristics um, that all look very similar. So everything that we call part of this genus has huge molar teeth and really tiny um, incisors and really tiny canines. And they also have these like massively flaring cheekbones. Um, so those would be some of the characteristics that we would include in our analysis among, say, 100 um, to try and sort out who's related to who. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we'll come back to uh, teeth and specifically molars later on in the interview, because I have a question related to the relationship between microevolution and macroevolution. But uh, I mean, uh, of course, we would probably need more time to get into this. But uh, generally speaking, look across hominin species. Do we know what changes mostly in terms of their uh, dental features? I mean, is it the number of each specific type of teeth? Is it the format of the teeth? Uh, what changes exactly? If we're looking, if we're just talking about kind of broad trends in the dentition across hominins, there are a couple yeah. kind of key defining features. The first that distinguishes us from our ape relatives is going to be yeah. that our canines get much smaller. Hmm. Um, and so we see this even very early on in the fossil record. You see kind of a reduction in dimorphism. So we don't have males with giant canines anymore. Yeah. Um, if we move a little bit further back, our premolars, um, get what we call much more molarized. So our premolars get bigger uh, and provide a bigger chewing space. Um, the molars also tend to get larger, uh, especially in the Australopithecines. Um, and along with that, we see kind of across hominins, a thickening of dental enamel relative to the size of the tooth. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, when it comes to the molars and premolars, does the number of cuspids change or not? Or, uh... the, the kind of basic bowel plan remains the same, but in some mm -hmm. of these species where you get really big molars, you, got, you get like little extra cusps, what we call cuspules or accessory mm -hmm. cusps. Um, so we've still got, if we're talking about a lower molar, we've still got kind of our five primary cusps, but mm -hmm. then you'll see some extra little bumps kind of between them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so moving on to another topic, a broader topic, I guess, do we have a full picture of hominin phylogeny at this point? So I think when we're looking at phylogenetics in the fossil record, we have to keep an open mind that this is a hypothesis based on the evidence that we have. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we have to be very open to that changing if we find a new hominin species that completely kind of flips our understanding of yeah. that. Um, I think right now we have a pretty good idea of kind of broad trends through time. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I am open to being wrong. Um, 
Uh, so I, I think, you know, there, there are always new fossil discoveries that could change that. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, that uh, to a certain extent, this is not a fair question to ask because we are limited to the fossils we find, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and there are some parts of the record that are sampled really well. Um, mm -hmm. Say, you know, kind of around three million years, we have a lot of Australopithecine species. Um, yeah. I think we have a pretty good idea of what's going on in that time period. If you move earlier in the fossil record where we have, say, Sophilanthropus and, and Ardipithecus, it's, um, I, it's sparse. Yeah. And I guess that the picture of our evolutionary history will always be forever changing because, I mean, as we uncover newer fossils, uh, I mean, new information with, will come in, right? Exactly. And, and not every fossil that we find is going to be a direct ancestor. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we can't just put together this very linear progression anymore. We have to, when we find a new fossil, we have to accept that maybe that's kind of a side branch on its own um, with kind of its own evolutionary anomalies. Yeah. Uh, but to get into uh, some examples of uh, species, uh, or at least some of the ones that you've done work on, so tell us a little bit about Ardipithecus ramidus. So what is that species exactly, and is it a hominin or not? Yeah, so the species was originally described by Tim Light and, and his team in 1994. Um, but at the time they described it, it was a little bit of a basocranium and some teeth, a few other bits and pieces. Um, but at the time, they still ascribed it to a hominin based on kind of some of the shape of the basocranium and, and the morphology that we see in the teeth. Because again, that's one of the one of the features we we understand pretty well in hominins. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the, the previous kind of reconstructions of hominin phylogenetics had, had just included that original set of data. Um, later on, uh, the team with Tim White and, and Gensua and, and a number of, of co-authors in 2009 published this nearly complete skeleton um, and cranium. So we go from having very little evidence for what the species looks like to an almost complete picture. Um, and so the, the paper I think you're referring to, we, we wanted to incorporate that data into our analysis mm -hmm. because as a basal hominin or something at the base of the tree, that's going to impact how we reconstruct everything else in the tree. Um, so with that, uh, I think, you know, it's general consensus. There are maybe a few outliers, but general consensus that Ardipithecus is a hominin. Um, it is a fairly basal hominin. It's around four and a half million years old. Um, and it has a, a really interesting combination of what we would consider more derived hominin-like traits. And that's in the dentition and kind of in the position of the foramen magnum. It also has a pelvis that indicates bipedalism with some surprising traits, like it has a, a grasping big toe and these really long phalanges. Mm -hmm. uh, and do we know what its phylogenetic relationships are? I mean, how does it relate to other hominids? Um, so we reconstruct it as being uh, one of the most basal hominins, so the most ancestral on the hominin tree. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not Sahelanthropus is also kind of in that similar position, I think is a bit more up for debate. Mm -hmm. um, but but Ardipithecus, I think, falls really well kind of at the, the very earliest evidence we have for hominin. Mm -hmm. And how about Austro Australopithecus sediba? Uh, when it comes to hominin phylogeny, where is it placed exactly? And how does it relate specifically to the Homo genus? Yeah, so we're jumping from very early in the hominin tree at around four and a half million years to mm -hmm. quite a bit later in time at around two million years. Okay. Um, so Sediba is this Australopithecine that Lee Berger and colleagues um, discovered and described from South Africa. And it was described as a little bit homo-like at the time because it it has some features like um, like a flatter face and uh, reduced post-orbital constriction, meaning that 
kind of right behind the eyes, the, the brain case is broad, um, that they, they associated more with our own genus. The problem um, is that it's pretty late in time if we want to call it an ancestor of Homo. So the genus Homo, we think, originated much earlier than that. Um, that doesn't mean that we aren't seeing some late remnant of an ancestor of Homo. Um, so in our analysis, we wanted to look at the Sediba fossils um, and ask this question, is it potentially you know, more closely related to Homo than everything else? Mm -hmm. um, or is it just looking that way because the skull that we have is a juvenile? Um, and so maybe some of those features are just because we're looking at a 12-year-old. Um, our analysis found that it's still most closely related to the genus Homo. Um, so, you know, that raises the question of, is there a ghost lineage uh, kind of in South Africa going back at least a million, million and a half years um, where this earlier version of Sediba would have, would have been closer to the base of the genus Homo? Yeah, I guess that in terms of, phylogen of phylogenetics, it would be great to find our last common ancestor with chimps and bonobos, right? So that, yeah, that would be much earlier in the tree. That would be more yeah. like um, Ramidus, yeah. Um, well, this would be kind of looking for our last common ancestor with something like Paranthropus. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, at this point in time, where exactly in time do people place our last common ancestor? It's like seven to eight million years ago, something like that. Or... Um, our last common ancestor with chimpanzees, kind of based mm -hmm. on genetic estimates, and that can change depending on your molecular clock model. Yeah, um, yeah is somewhere between five and seven million years mm -hmm. ago. Okay. So uh, let's get into the topic uh, that I mentioned earlier, the distinction between microevolution and macroevolution and how they might relate to one another. So first of all, tell us about that distinction. What exactly does microevolution and macroevolution mean in evolutionary biology and paleoanthropology specifically? Yeah, so this is kind of leaving the realm of of paleoanthropology a little bit just because it's yeah. very hard to infer from fossils. Um, but just to define um, microevolution, evolutionary biologists tend to think of as kind of genetic change in population. So mm -hmm. kind of gene or allele frequencies, uh, kind of generational basis through time, right? So you'll see, you know, someone looking at flies in a lab and looking at mm -hmm. change over hundred generations of flies. Macroevolution is more in the in the paleo realm, uh, and that's where we look at change over millions of years. Um, so we're not looking at change between generations or populations, but we're looking at change between species or even between large radiations. Um, and one of the questions I think that's really central to evolutionary biology right now is how do we take what we know in the lab? So how do we take patterns um, of, of microevolution and mm -hmm. apply that to these kind of deep time scales? Yeah. Um, and do they match up or not? And they don't always. Um, so one of the, the projects that we wanted to do is say, can we take something like the primate dentition, uh, where we have a really nice fossil record, we have a deep time scale, we have samples across 60 species, um, and kind of apply what's known about the development of that dentition and the genetics of that dentition um, to try and link the two. Uh, and so, could, uh, of course, you can stick to dentition, but uh, could you give us examples of how, what do you look for when you want to study microevolution and macroevolution in hominin species? So again, in hominins, it's really hard um, because mm -hmm. we don't have that kind of population to really study microevolution. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we use primates kind of clade wide uh, mm -hmm. in our analysis. Um, but you're looking for kind of small phenotypic changes in, in whatever trait you're looking at, right? Um, 
in our case, looking at kind of just changes in tooth size across populations versus across all primates. And yeah. at least can we take the pattern of one thing and extract it to another? Um, and, and does that match or does it not? And if it doesn't, then what might explain that? And the, the most obvious explanation would be that maybe natural selection has been acting in a way that we don't just have kind of small to big patterning over time. And how does microevolution and macroevolution interact with one another? I mean, th does that happen or not? Yeah, well, that's the question. Um, yeah. So one expectation is that, you know, you have variation within a population, right? Yeah. And if you have more variation, you have more opportunity for natural selection to act because um, natural selection is, is just acting on, on standing variation. Mm -hmm. So potentially you might extrapolate that a trait that has more variation at the population level would have faster rates of evolution kind of across deep time. Yeah. Um, but there are lots of complicating factors in that. So is that trait evolving by drift alone or do we have natural selection mm -hmm. kind of guiding that process? And then you might not expect that one-to-one kind of variation to rates of change. And so earlier I mentioned that we would come back to teeth when we talk about this subject. Uh, you've done work, for example, on primate molars. Uh, I, I mean, in what ways does studying prim uh, can studying primate molars help us perhaps uncover a common mechanism that drives the alignment of micro and macro evolution. Yeah, so in that study, we wanted to look specifically at whether or not the variation pattern in primate molars kind of mapped out over deep time. Mm -hmm. So we understand, uh, because of a lot of work from a lot of people um, before me, we understand the developmental dynamics of the primate dentition or the mammalian dentition in general pretty well. Yeah. Um, and so we have three molars and because of how they develop and the order that they develop, you tend to have structured variation where the last developing or the M3 is a lot more variable. Uh, and you can think about this in humans, even having or not having a wisdom tooth, um, that would be the human M3. So do we see over kind of deep evolutionary time, faster rates of evolution in that third molar than we see in the second or the first? And so we were looking across primates to, to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we, if we think about how does that apply to the fossil record, how can we take this back to looking at hominins? Um, it might tell you something about, you know, when you start to see change in the fossil record, say you see like very different uh, M3s or third molars, um, maybe you're seeing an early diversification between two species. But if you see very different M1s, then maybe we're seeing something that's like a bit of a deeper split between these two groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, what does that mean? Or uh, can it mean anything for when it comes to establishing a link between developmental processes and evolutionary dynamics, for example? I think it can tell us how much of a role development plays in kind of guiding these processes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think if anything, development is, it's kind of generating the variation that is playing out over deep time, but it also may be that there are developmental constraints that provide guardrails on how much change can happen in a particular direction. Um, and I think a really nice um, paper about this, if, if anyone is interested, is um, Anjali Goswami's lab did one called A Fly in a Tube, where this is kind of our analogy for the fly going through uh, kind of this constrained space of like how much change can possibly happen. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess that this ties us uh, uh, or these links back to discussions that have been uh, that have been occurring in evolutionary biology for a few decades now, if I remember correctly, between the developmental biologists and the 
uh, I, I guess developmental biologists are also evolutionary biologists themselves, but between the developmental biologists and the evolutionary biologists, when it comes to some of the constraints that perhaps development might have on evolution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a genetic evolution, that is. Yeah, and we all work in such separate labs. Um, so developmental biology is its own field and evolutionary biology. And then within that, paleontologists are kind of out <laughs> in the desert doing their own thing. Um, so bringing all of those concepts together, I think, is, is a really important kind of frontier moving forward in biology. And, and of course, there are a lot of people working on that, but it's not always kind of straightforward that the the data types overlap and the, the questions being asked are not always the same. Um, I think it's a really interesting uh, kind of future avenue in biology. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and it's very interesting also because there are people that uh, propose an extended, uh, extended evolutionary synthesis that base their arguments at least to some extent on exactly this kind of discussion and dynamic between development and evolution, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, in order for us to, and this will be the last topic of our interview today, so in order for us to model hominin evolution, because that's something that paleoanthropologists like yourself are also interested in, uh, what is the most accurate and rigorous data we can, ac we can have access to and that we need to do that? So, I am a big proponent of really understanding the fossil record and the limitations thereof. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so tempting with this kind of like big data analyses these days to, to go through lots of published papers and say, all right, there's a habilis humerus and I'm going to take this Rudolph Insis femur and this whatever and put it all in a big analysis mm -hmm. um, and say something about human evolution. Um, what that overlooks is you know, actually that femur probably isn't attributable to Rudolph Insis. We have no idea what a Rudolph Insis femur looks like. That was a scrap of something that came out of this like poorly dated deposit. And and just so all of it is, is kind of taking into account the, the history of these fossil discoveries and how much we actually can say about them. Um, when can we actually attribute something to a species? Um, taking into account how well dated that particular specimen is. Um, and there's a lot of variation in that. So say something that's found in the Turkana Basin between two volcanic ash layers, it's gonna have very different dating accuracy than something found on the surface in Chad or in a cave in South Africa. And so taking into account all of these different sources of error um, in your analysis and, and what we actually know about the fossils, I think is critically important you're going to make these like big claims about kind of explaining human evolution. So looking at human phylogenetics, what would you say are some of the most interesting still unanswered questions that you would really love to see answered in the future? Um, so there are a few key areas. One um, is more fossils at the base of the tree. I think, you know, Ramidus is really interesting and, and there's still some questions of, is that um, skeleton representative of the actual kind of last common ancestor or is it a bit derived on its own? Mm -hmm. um, we know it's a hominin, but is it a hominin that's then kind of evolving in its own direction for a million years? And what would the um, kind of earlier version of that look like? So if you think about kind of Sampling, if, if you're a, a budding paleoanthropologist and you want to go find a, a new fossil that would make all of us really happy, um, start looking in some of those like five million year, five and a half million year deposits if you could find some. Um, that would be great. I would also love to see on the other side of the tree what some of the very earliest chimpanzee ancestors looked like. Because when we're looking at chimpanzees, we're looking at something that's also been evolving for five million years. And so if we're going to make a, a direct comparison to hominin evolution, what was that starting point? Um, so just on the opposite side of the tree, I think would be really exciting to find. Um, skipping through time, 
Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think about kind of three, three and a half million years, um, finding more evidence for kind of origin of the genus Homo. Everyone wants to know kind of why and where and when did, did our own genus evolve. Um, so new fossils in that part of the tree would be exciting, although it's, it's always hard, like when you find those very earliest specimens, like how do you know that that's what it is? Um, yeah. It's not got that fully derived fleet of characters yet. And then a, quite a bit later in time um, and kind of getting into where genetics might be able to tell us something is what we call the metal in the middle. So around 500,000 years ago when we've got um, kind of Homo heidelbergensis, whatever that is, uh, giving rise to all of these later species, including ourselves, so Neanderthals and humans and, and whatever else is going on that we keep finding these new things, um, more evidence in that time frame would also be really exciting, although that's not a period I, I necessarily work on. Yeah, and of course, I imagine that there are always ongoing debates on all of this, particularly also when it comes to phylogenetics, for example, how we, the criteria we base our classification of species on, right? Because that's also a debate, and particularly when a new fossil pops up, that it's really hard to classify as one or the other species, or if it's even a new species altogether, I mean, people are all the time debating those sorts of issues, correct? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge debate. Um, and I, I hinted at that a little bit in, in your last question of, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of data should, or like accuracy should people be paying attention to? And that's, yeah. that's one of the key ones is, what are we calling homo habilis? No one agrees. So at least people kind of, need to be internally consistent and in, in defining what fossils they're actually putting in that category so that people coming back to this analysis can say, oh, actually, I, I don't agree that this one South African fossil belongs in the Homo habilis grouping. And so I actually disagree with the conclusions on that basis. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you also mentioned, uh, this will probably be my last comment, but you also mentioned there at a certain point that we should try also to find, uh, if possible, of course, fossils that uh, are of the of species that came before uh, modern day chimpanzees, I guess. I, I mean, uh, what came what came after our last common ancestor, but are mm -hmm. not yet uh, chimpanzees as we have them uh, nowadays, uh, because I mean, when uh, curiously enough, even though I've already had many discussions with paleoanthropologists on the show, uh, we usually tend to discuss what's occurring since the last common ancestor, but uh, in uh, along the lineage that led to hominins and not so much <laughs> and we don't talk that much about what happened since the last common ancestor uh, on the lineage that leads to chimpanzees so yeah that, that, that would probably also be a little bit informative when it comes to understanding what our last common ancestor would have looked like, looked like. right yeah yeah it would go a really long way um, even to the, the debate about, um, you know, we see gorillas are, are knuckle walkers, chimps are knuckle walkers. Yeah. Um, were those ancestors knuckle walkers? And what does that mean about kind of what the earliest hominin would have evolved from? Um, yeah. A lot of people don't think that that's the case, but if not, then what? Um, yeah, so I, I would love to see an, an like four million year old uh, kind of pan uh, fossil. <laughs> right. So, uh, would you like to tell us uh, what your what work you're doing on at the mo you're doing at the moment, and what you're going to work on in the near future? Yeah, of course. Um, so, on the the phylogenetic side of things, I am currently trying to incorporate postcranial data. So, our tree as is is based entirely on kind of neck up. And there are historical reasons for that. The, the biggest one being that for a really long time, you know, you find a, an isolated partial femur in the field, you have no idea what that goes with. Um, and so we've been working on kind of skulls and teeth 
Recent discoveries have changed that. So we have a lot of new partial skeletons that we actually can analyze. And so I think that's one really exciting avenue is, is kind of shaking up the tree with looking at the rest of the skeleton. Um, and then also incorporating some geochronology into those analyses. So not just the anatomy, but looking at kind of how old things are and using that to, um, what's the word I'm looking for, to kind of scale our tree. Yeah. Um, so that's another another avenue. I'm also I'm working really actively with Louise Leakey and the um, Kubi for a research project. Um, so some new and exciting fossils I think are are on their way soon. Um, very very happy to be part of that. Um, and then continuing a little bit of the work on some of the the evolutionary modeling. Um, kind of the micro to macro evolution and mm -hmm. um, some of my co-authors I think are going to be taking the lead on that on the on the next few papers so um, a bit more in the evolutionary biology realm of things but uh, Fabio Machado and um, Yosef Vieta are doing doing a lot of work on that and I'm happy to be part of that team as well. Great and just before we go would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure. Um, so you mentioned I, I have a lab. I'm accepting graduate students um, as well as postdocs. If, if someone wanted to, to do an NSS together, uh, my lab website is mongolab.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter. I think it's my handle is just my name. So it's at Carrie Mongol. Um, and I'm the person behind the IDPAS Twitter, which is the Stony Brook uh, PhD program. So any of those places online. Great. So I'm leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Mongol, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Great questions. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please do not forget to like it, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you like more generally what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You, get, you have all of the links in the description of this interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alec, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbur Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Ruinacio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Triago Duns, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Librand, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tam Amal, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desarauzo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevsky, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Panos Cortez, Usla Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichland, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stéphanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Olozen, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Eriksson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Holt Erickbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassis, Tom Roth, the RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Manuel Oliveira, Kimberly Johnson, and Benjamin Galbart. A special thanks to my producers, these are Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz.
and to my executive producers Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.